Well, 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 we're back on the airwaves for Season 2, Episode 1, and boy, do we have a good one for you today. We'll touch base on some news, learn a little bit about DMB's history, and speak to Bob, a Ph.D. with ties to both Leroy Moore and Jeff Coffin. And we'll close the episode with our new segment titled, The Way I Heard It. So sit back, relax, and welcome to the best of what's around. Welcome to DMB On Demand, the podcast. So we have just a few updates this week regarding DMB On Demand. With the shop, we have a few new designs coming this week, and now is a good time to stock up on designs based around the music we all love, since there's no tour. Stock up in 2020 to be all set up and ready for 2021. We've been loving the conversations we've had on Twitter while the DMB drive-in has been going on. If you haven't been a part of that, then head over to Twitter and follow DMB On Demand and pop in next Wednesday while the show plays on YouTube. It's guaranteed to be a lot of fun. As far as the podcast goes, I've actually taken a few courses on the Adobe software used to produce these episodes and have a system down pat now so we should not have any hiccups in our publication date of each Monday and the overall sound quality and atmosphere will do nothing but improve as we go into Season 2. Also, each week we'll share a bit of DMB history about the band. We're going to start at the beginning, in 1991, and each week we'll move up a year until we get to 2020. So let's roll back the calendars to 1991 and see what was going on during the early rumblings of the Dave Matthews Band. Dave Matthews Band formed in Charlottesville, Virginia in early 1991 when vocalist and guitarist Dave Matthews decided to put some songs he had written on tape. Instead of simply recording himself with a guitar, he opted to bring in some instrumental help to give his music and ideas more depth. Matthews found assistance in drummer Carter Belford and saxophonist Leroy Moore, who were both accomplished jazz music musicians in the local Charlottesville scene. Based on the recommendation of a distinguished local jazz guru, John D. Earth, 16-year-old musical prodigy Stefan Lassard came on to play bass. Completing the lineup were keyboard player Peter, who later left the band after a few years, and talented and classically trained violinist Boy Tinsley. The band's first public performances were at the Middle East Children's Alliance Benefit at Tracks Nightclub in March and at the City of Charlottesville Earth Day Festival in April. The first official gig for the newly conceived Dave Matthews Band was May 11, 1991, at a private party held on the rooftop of the Pink Warehouse on South Street in downtown Charlottesville. This is the same warehouse for the title track's song of the same name. Regular gigs soon followed at two local nightclubs, Eastern Standard and Tracks Nightclub. Next week, we'll jump ahead a year to 1992 and see how the band really got its footing in the local scene and started to grow. Now that the notes and DMB history session are in the books, Let's dive right into our interview to roll out Season 2 with a bang.
Well, folks, we have a interesting interview for you today. This is um, a special treat. You're going to meet somebody who has a life's work that is unique and clearly something that he's poured his whole heart into. He's very articulate, and his story is uh, mesmerizing. As you know, I have a survey that people fill out before they come on the podcast, and it serves two purposes. The first is that it allows the guest to know generally what the questions will be, and it allows me to get to know the person a little bit more prior to the interview. And I'm telling you, the response to this form was thorough and gave me a good glimpse of who I'll be interviewing. And music is intertwined with this man's life more than maybe anybody I've ever met. And what's more interesting to me is that the road to get to where he is, the road to live out his dream and his love was met with resistance from the very people that should have been nurturing that call and allowing it to flourish. So by no means has this life come easy to our guest. He's fought for every bit that he has. And folks, he has a lot. So I'm excited to jump right into the interview. So we're going to do that. We're interviewing Bob today. Bob, before we get into the the music-centric questions, I kind of want to just take a moment and let you expand on, well, just round you out as a person, you know, what you do for a living, your interests, your hobbies, and just kind of round it out for the folks and let them get to know you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Dr. Bob Fusen. Uh, I am a music professor. Uh, I'm also a music director at a Unitarian church. Uh, I'm married. I have three children. Uh, I'm a professional musician, a published composer, and arranger. Um, I've been a professional musician for about 21 years now. Uh, I've been living in Nebraska for about 10. Um, interests and hobbies. I'm a big history fan, um, which I'm sure we'll get into later because uh, a lot of my work is historical. Uh, I love video games. I play a lot of video games with my kids. Um, I, I enjoy a good cigar and a good bourbon every now and then. Uh, I like to travel when we're allowed to travel again. Um, and yeah, that's me. Do you, do you find that um, your kids are starting to influence um, influence your, your life's work? Have you had any influence at all with your career uh, after you had your kids? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, when I was in college, uh, I was not the greatest student. And so I actually went back and every degree that I got, um, I did as a father and a husband. Um, so there's definitely been an influence in terms of motivation, um, inspiration, uh, and leaving a, um, a legacy, of course. Um, that's something that you want to leave to your children. Um, my family on both sides are are laborers, uh, farmers, truck drivers, um, you know, a military, uh, very blue collar, very hard workers. Um, I was the first person in my family to, to ever go to college, and I'm certainly the most educated. So I think it's about preserving that legacy of, of showing that um, that uh, there, there are so many things you can do, even when um, the deck might be a little bit stacked against you. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely had an influence. Um, in, in that sense, um, my kids are not the biggest um, DMB fans. They know the songs. Um, they know what my favorite song is. Um, they will uh, sometimes if I have to go on a trip, they will sneak into my office and 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 play a song because well, I miss dad. So they'll play a DMB song because that's what I listen to a lot. Um, yeah, it's but it's more about the work is more about leaving them something that they can be. Um, proud of not not necessarily that I want them to do the same thing I'm doing but um, being a parent that they can look back on and say you know my dad really did something he really brought something into the world that that wasn't there before um, 
It also helps that my kids are named after a few band members um, in in honor of them um, and a favorite historical figure of mine. So, um, yeah, there there is an intertwining there for sure. Okay. Well, you said your kids know your favorite song, so we're going to use that and just segue into uh, some of the DMB centric questions. So, what is your favorite DMB song, and and why is that particular one your favorite? Yeah, my favorite is without a doubt Ants Marching, uh, and and it's sort of a long story, but um, so I started playing the saxophone when I was ten uh, in fifth grade, and that was the same year that my parents um, split up and got divorced. Um, so there were two kind of very life altering events that happened in that year. Um, the divorce did not go well. Um, us kids were kind of stuck in the middle. Um, we lived in a, a terribly abusive household. And so I kind of retreated into music. Um, I knew very early on, uh, by sixth grade, I knew it was what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, the problem was um, no one else thought that that was a profession worth pursuing. And I should explain that uh, it wasn't music specifically. It was a, a result of growing up with a, a mother who had some undiagnosed mental health issues. And if I had wanted to be a welder or a poet or an architect, I think she would have taken the, the same tact that she did, um, which was to basically uh, throw up as many roadblocks as possible uh, uh, to this to this thing that I wanted. When I do clinics, students ask me, I'm why sorry, did you... I, I'm sorry, Bob, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but could you please explain a little bit like what you mean when you say roadblocks? Uh, yeah. So anytime I would get in trouble uh, for the smallest offenses, she would threaten to pull me out of music. Um, she would threaten to sell my saxophone out from under me if I made her mad, which was frequently. Um, my uh, I have a brother who at the time was an athlete and um, she very much lived vicariously through him. So anything I did, she seemed um, uh, it, it seemed embarrassing to her versus what my brother was doing. And she would introduce us differently. She would call my brother the athlete. And then she would uh, describe me with a, um, a slur, a gay slur. Um, and so it was a uh, it was it was tough. Um, but as I was saying before, when when I talk to students, and they ask me why I chose music. Um, that's hard to answer because I feel like music chose me. I, I didn't have a say in it. I, I knew it was what I wanted to do. And and really, that's the thing that helped me get through the very difficult time in my life from the time my parents split to, to even to this day, I still deal with the, the repercussions. Um, so uh, to, to, to make a long story even longer, uh, I, I retreated into music and I was very into jazz and classical music, um, very into that. And, and I kind of um, looked down my nose on, upon things that were popular, as we all do when we're 12 and 13 years old and we think we know everything. Um, so even though I grew up in the 90s, I was sort of oblivious to what was going on with popular music for a long time. Um, and that started to change. Um, then in the summer of 1999, uh, I, I was uh, at a friend's house for a sleepover, and he had a mix CD. I, I'm, I know I'm dating myself a bit, but it had you know Eric Clapton and the Beatles and all kinds of stuff. So he gets to a track, um, and what plays are these three snare drum hits, these three cracks, right? Crack, crack. Crack. And I'd never heard a song start like that. And about the time those three cracks happened, my friend moved on to the next track. And I said, go back. What was that? And he said, you, you've never heard that before. And I said, no, what is that? I never heard a song start like that. So he let it play. And it was Ants Marching. And as soon as the uh, the soprano saxophone came in, I was, uh, I was hooked. Um, it was like a fire had been lit. Um, I mean, I'm getting, you know, goosebumps talking about it now. Um, the other thing to remember is that in the 90s, if you played soprano, um, for those of you who, who are not musically inclined, soprano is the, the little saxophone um, that Leroy would play during Ants Marching. If you played the soprano, then people would inevitably compare you to Kenny G. Um, Kenny G kind of the like the the worst version of a saxophonist, um, somebody who played really cheesy music. And, <laughs> and so but here was this soprano saxophone, this beautiful sound, this gorgeous round just unbelievable sound and it was playing uh these riffs and and these solos that were that were uh, i mean it, it just it just grabbed me it, it just instantly grabbed me uh so i i made my friend burn uh burn the cd for me under the table and dreaming um 
And I would feel guilty about that, except I've had to replace that burn CD many, many times. And I think I have <laughs> seven copies of that album at my house between CDs nice. and cassettes and vinyl. So, um, nice. so I, I paid for that burn CD, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So he burned it for me and I took it home and I just put Ants Marching on repeat. Just, just constantly. I just could not get enough of it. I couldn't stop listening to it. And this life I had been living in this abusive household, um, which had been very dark and gray and dreary, was suddenly like the whole world was in technicolor. All of these things that I had been told that musicians were losers, that they wouldn't amount to anything and nothing I did would ever matter and there was no way to be, to do this and be considered important or popular and whatever. That all went out the window. It exposed all of those things I've been told as a great big lie. And and nothing became more important than chasing this. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I chased, I started listening to other songs in the album. Um, you know, I'd come home from high school and I'd put Ants Marching on repeat. And my mom would stomp on the floor and yell at me to turn it off. And I never, ever did. It, it, was, it was the first time I really took a stand for myself. And it became an obsession. Um, really, because it was music I'd never heard before. And it had all of these things that I felt inside. You know, musicians and artists have a part of their soul that they're trying to get out into the universe. And we have to reconcile with the things that influence us to get those things out. When I heard Ants Marching for the first time, I, I realized a huge part of my soul had been revealed to me, if, if that makes sense. Um, and so... I knew this was part of what I wanted to do. I, I knew this was a big part of who I was. This was something, th this was the mysterious thing I'd been chasing for so many years. Um, this was a lot of it. And um, so I, I just, I kept chasing that. I, I, I kept, I just couldn't get enough of it. And then that September of 99, um, I went to Farm Aid because the, the tour had been sold out long before. But I managed to get tickets to Farm Aid 99, which is in, uh, Virginia, not not far from where I lived. Um, and it was probably the best set to, to have for a new fan because it was a very short set, like seven songs. It was all pretty much radio hits, Don't Drink the Water and What Would You Say? And, and then they played Ants Marching. And I remember sitting on the lawn and thinking, uh, when that song started, being in that space, in that air, with him and that sound, it was... It was a religious experience for me. It, it was um, it was everything I'd ever wanted in life. It was joy that I did not know previously, that I did not think was possible previously. And here was the path. Um, here was the light to to shine on that path to to get me out of this place. Um, so yeah, Ants Marching, my favorite song, will always be my favorite song. Um, funnily enough, when I fly, if the plane gets turbulent, uh, I put that song on just in case, just in case it, it's it's the last thing that I hear. Um, it's a little bit superstitious, but that's how much that song means to me. It really did change my life completely. That's amazing. Um, the one thing that I never thought about is when you say you were you were there and hearing the horn come in and all of a sudden you're sharing that space. Never really thought of thought of it as you know having a, an actual dimension like you're in this space with the music. Uh, I guess I never really thought about it from that perspective before. It's pretty unique. So folks, I just there's one thing I forgot to mention up front. Uh, I told Bob to expand as much as he wants to um, now that you've heard the answer to the first question you see exactly why i told him to expand um, not only is he well spoken but the story he has to tell is just mesmerizing so uh, get comfortable get comfortable for this for this episode um, all right so we got the song let's switch over to lyrics uh, what's your favorite DMB lyric, and why is that particular one your favorite? Well, as as most DMB fans do, I have a, a lot, um, and and I'm hopefully I can keep this to because it changes as with you know favorite songs. Hopefully, I can keep this going with the the form I filled out. But my my favorite for the last several years has been a line from Proudest Monkey, which is. Uh, I prefer the the live version where he sings. In a way, those were my better days. Um, and and in the context of the song, um, the idea that when we are younger, and and somewhat more ignorant of of how the world is, um, that we hold on to those um, as our better days. 
Um, and, and I really, I really feel that because the first 10 years of my parents' marriage before they split, they were storybook parents. You couldn't have asked for better, you couldn't have written better parents. And then everything went so unbelievably bad. Um, so those literally were my better days. Uh, and the, uh, the idea that uh, growing up and maturing and evolving comes with um, burdens to bear, um, that's, that to me it, uh, it really, really speaks to me. Okay, I think that is a first for the podcast. That was an interesting choice, Proudest Monkey. So typically, the next question would be, what's your favorite band member, or who is your favorite band member and why? But I think we're going to divert from the um, question that's expected. And instead, what I'd like you to do, I'm trying to think of how to intro this. Instead, what I'd like you to do is... Tell us your story as it relates to Leroy, and then tell us your story as it relates to Jeff. And I know those are two very big questions. So, um, folks, if if we don't get to everything today, I've already told Bob that we're going to have him on for a second time. So, uh, as you go as deep as you're comfortable with, Bob, and take your time and, and let us know your story as it relates to Leroy and then as it relates to Jeff. Yeah, so let's well let's start with Leroy. Um, I've I've given um, a little bit of that in the the answer to my favorite song, but uh, Leroy hooked me, and and I and I should mention also um, it was Leroy, but it was also the. The, the, the drumming. It was also Carter. It was that one-two punch. Um, jazz musicians are, are closet drummers, I believe, and so uh, we get really locked into what the drummer is doing. And so it was this combination of really just intense drumming and, and the most poetic saxophone work that really, really drew me in. Um, and then I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Boyd was a big reason also. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, but I was born in Kentucky. I have family in Kentucky. And country and bluegrass music is a big part of my life. And so here's this band doing everything that I love. They're doing country. They're doing bluegrass. They're doing rock. They're doing jazz. They're doing everything. So it, it was kind of a domino effect. It was Leroy that pulled me in and then Carter and then from there. Um, but I, I just became... Um, obsessed with Leroy's playing because he always played the right thing. He always played the right thing for the moment. Um, saxophonists, by and large, uh, are very technically proficient in the jazz world. So I was listening to a lot of these saxophonists that I didn't quite understand. Uh, uh, their, their language th that they were using was too advanced for me. Um, Leroy's I could understand because it had an emotional impact. Um, it affected me inside. And I just, I just had to hear everything that he did, uh, because it was so new. It was so different to what I had been used to. Um, it wasn't this huge technical barrage of notes. It was the exact right note for the right time. He had a sixth sense for that. And that's not a skill that you can learn. That's, that's at least not easily. That's a very, very tricky thing to do. And so I, I just had to absorb as much as possible. Um, I, I started getting all the albums, getting the live albums. Um, I remember listening to his solo on Lion Our Graves from Live at Red Rocks. And that is a masterpiece of modern improvisation. Um, we, we talk about improvisation in terms of telling a story. And you can almost hear the words in his solo. It's almost like speaking. Um, and, and I just absorbed all this as much as I could. I went to shows. Um, I went to RFK in 2000 and Hershey in 2000. Um, so I, 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 I managed to get in right at like the real musical uh, apex of their playing. You know, that 2000 tour was, God, it was something else, something to behold. But my story with Leroy and the band, um, so right around the time that, uh, that, uh, that 2000 tour was happening, and all of that turmoil was happening with the Lily White sessions and every day. Things had really taken a downturn at my house. Um, my, my mother had gotten a little more off the hinges. Um, I was getting ready to graduate and leave and be gone from there. And so her hold on me was loosening. And, and so um, if you've ever had 
any experience with someone who's who has narcissistic personality disorder or anything like that. Uh, she had gotten worse um, and even more controlling and demanding. So I was really at a, a low point uh, in my life. Um, and and I won't go so far as to say considering anything extreme, but um, but really in a in a pit of despair. Um, and then the Lily White sessions came out. Uh, I, I was on. I was a frantic user of DMBML back in the day. Nancy's a little bit, but DMBML was my place. And I remember when those broke, and downloading those tracks, and listening to those versions. Um, and and those of you who've heard it know it sounds like somebody beat the absolute crap out of Dave and threw him in the booth and made him sing some of those songs. And it, and it was another bolt of of light that that here's my story being told in some way. Um, and of course, you know, Leroy's uh, playing on that version of Bartender with the overdubs. That's that's another piece of musical genius. And so, you know, there are a lot of what ifs there, uh, but I, I fully believe that that album may have saved my life, maybe, ch- but did completely change my life um, and, and helped me get out of that situation. And Leroy's been my favorite saxophonist since then, since 99, since I heard Ants Marching, um, has consistently been my favorite saxophonist. Um, and one of the issues that I had when I went to school for music was uh, academia has this thing where they have a track for you and they expect you to conform to certain demands. So it's not appropriate for you to say my favorite saxophonist is Leroy Moore because there are so many other giants that you need to be listening to. But at the end of the day, I would leave the music building and I'd put DMB on. That's what made me feel good. That's what made me practice. That's what got me up in the morning. And I really wanted to close the gap between what we listen to in the car on the way to the music building and what we do in the music building, which has a lot to do with the work I've done, which we can get to later. But um, let me switch to over to Jeff. So my my DMB fandom um, and my obsession with with hearing as much as I possibly could led me to start uh, digging around to other groups that were mentioned, um, like Agents of Good Roots, which is another of my favorite bands. Um, JC Cool, um, I interviewed him for my some of my work. He's a great guy, one of my favorite saxophonists. And I kept hearing about uh, this show. Everybody would say, what's the best DMB show? And I kept hearing about this show with a group called Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. That was consistently the number one show that people would would vote for. So I started looking up Bela Fleck and the Flectones. Oh man, yeah. And they had a saxophonist who yeah. you know, if if Leroy blew the roof off what I was conceiving, Jeff leveled the block. I mean <laughs> just completely destroyed yep. me in this in the same way that Leroy did. So so those guys have been my yin and yang. Those, every, those are Every Those single are, player on the, on the Flectones, man, every single player is outstanding from Victor Wooten to Jeff to Bale. They're, they're all just phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that combination, again, of bluegrass and jazz, and, and that really appealed to me. Um, and so, yeah, L- Leroy and Jeff, those are my guys. Those have been my two biggest influences since long before Leroy passed. Um, it's always been Leroy and Jeff. And so that was another thing I had to get as much of as possible into my brain. I started listening. And when I was in college, um, they came to the University of Kentucky. I was going to school in Kentucky, um, not at UK, but close by. And they were coming. And so um, I looked up Jeff's website and this is 2001. So I just emailed him and I said, I'm a saxophonist. I'm, I, I love your playing. I would love to sit down and talk to you. Um, Leroy is another of my favorite players. And, and I just want to know what makes you guys tick because these guys are doing stuff that is way left of center. They're not doing straight ahead jazz. They're not playing classical. They're not they're not doing like the funk Tower of Power or pop star thing. They're really improvising. They're really contributing in this format. And I I had to know how to do that. I had to know what made them tick. So I emailed him and he said, yeah, come before the show about this time and we'll meet. And it was the week after 9-11. I remember because Bela spoke about it uh, at length. Um, but Jeff met with me. Uh, we talked. Um, he was – let me just say, first of all, Jeff Coven is is one of the best people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, he He's he's so genuine and so pure and so positive. Uh, just one of the best people. 
Um, and he was so generous with me. I was an 18 year old nobody going to school in Kentucky. And, and he talked to me for like a, a good hour and a half. And uh, I went to the concert. At the tail end of our conversation, he invited me to Nashville to a CD release party he was doing. His album, Go Round, had just come out. Um, and I said, I have to go. I have to go to that. The guy just said, come to my CD release party. And he's my hero. I'm not turning that down. So I drove to Nashville and went to that, went to the concert um, and hung out with him. And Victor Wooten was there also. And over the years, we kept up a correspondence um, and... Um, had made plans for me to study with him. Um, and then Leroy passed um, and his schedule got much, much busier, obviously. And I always say about that situation, it would be like if, if your dad died and your mom remarried your favorite uncle. Um, it's it's probably the best possible situation, but but still a little bit uncomfortable, you know. So in 2011, when uh, they took that break and we're doing the caravan stuff, I reached out and said, hey, I think now might be the time for us to get together. If I can get a grant, can I come study with you? And he said, yeah, let me know. And, and I got a grant from the school I was at, at the time, the University of Nebraska. Uh, and I went to Nashville and I, I studied with him for about four days. And uh, and even though he'd been with DMB, he had the platinum album Away From The World, I think was, uh, no, sorry, it was Big Whiskey at the time, um, was on the, his wall. That guy worked. He he did studio sessions. He gigged. I went to every one of his gigs. He had a gig every night. Um, he works. So I, I've been very fortunate to know Jeff um, for, gosh, nearly 20 years now. Um, we're, we're friendly. Um, I don't know what I would describe our relationship as. We hug when we see each other. Um, he's a great dude, and I, I just I just love him to death. Yeah, so, folks, this is why I said I'm going to be having Bob back for a second episode, because I have... Every time, Bob, every time you speak, I have this list of questions that keeps trailing and trailing and trailing of things I want to ask. And I'm, I'm noting them down. It'd be too long for one session, but there's definitely plenty of area to explore. That's that's for sure. Um, so the next questions are how long have you been a fan? What song first made you a fan? But I think we already covered that pretty well. Um, with Ants and, and 99, that, that's correct, right? That would be the answer for that one. Yes. Yep. 1999. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so let's talk about the DMB community. It seems to me that there's layers to it. You know, you go to um, a concert and there's thousands of people that that are there and active, and and then you start to to see the hardcore fans who can tell you, you know, what kind of jersey Carter was wearing in 2001 at Alpine. Um, right. Just hardcore right. fans. And and then you have this subset there. It's like a family where people are actually practicing what they preach. Well, not what they preach, but what the music preaches and, and loving one another and, and being good to one another. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came into that DMB family, the, the more intimate circle and, and what does that community mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, as I said, I, I got started in 99. And so I was, as I said before, I was big into DMBML. Um, I was on Nancy's a little bit, um, but but really trying to soak up as much as I possibly could. And the thing that I noticed, um, I mean, this is this 20 years ago, so it's a vastly different time, but it was such a it was such a loving space. Um, it was such a, a uh, productive space for for the fans to really to really geek out about things that were going on. Um, to, to really, I mean, I, I can remember the early days of like, you know, people who were at soundcheck like outside the stadium or whatever, and they would call and their buddy would post on DMBML. Here's what they sound checked. And that's how, you know, we found out about some of the other tracks that were on the Lily White sessions that we we never heard. Like uh, um, so, yeah, it's from the beginning. It's always been a place where you can find um, conspirators, you know, you can and, and um, not not to give away the, the big surprise or anything. But I um, when I was in college, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Leroy's life and works. And when I was doing that. The community was such an enormous help, uh, and and not just the forums, um, but DMB Almanac was a huge help. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's it's really good to have 
um, a place that cares about what's going on. And sometimes it goes a little too far. Um, and, and that's happened in, in recent years. Um, but it's, it's good to have people who care. It's, it's good to have people who are invested in it. And they were so supportive when I was writing. I mean, I, I had, my blog was just populated with visits from all over the world. And, and my lecture recital was viewed by a ton of DMB fans. And, and my dissertation's been downloaded so many times, I think like 4,000 times now at this point. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very loving space. One thing that does concern me is some corners of it have become a little less loving, and um, and so I, I have taken somewhat of a step back, especially from the forums. But um, it's 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 nice to be around people who get it. Um, you know, I have people stop me. I had a guy stop me the other day at a stoplight because um, I was playing DMB, but also my license plate says Roy lives. So if if you know anything about the band, you can pick me out anywhere. And so he stopped me at a light and we talked about DMB for, you know, 30, 45 seconds before the light changed. And it's those kind of fans who have that same look in their eye that 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 I got and still get, you know, back then. Um, those are the people that I really connect with. Um, and, and like you said, there are layers to it, because when I was in high school, going to a show was a social event. Most of the people were there because it was the thing to do. Um, I graduated in 2001, and so you know half my high school would go to DMB shows, but they could not tell you what the songs were. It's, it's the fans who are there because they, they just can't wait to see what happens. Those are the ones that I connect with. All right, so... <clears throat> If you could pick one DMB song, and I know it can be tough to narrow down a single song uh, for any question, but if you can pick one DMB song to let each human on Earth listen to one time, what gift would you give everybody? What song would you have them sit down and listen to, everybody on the planet? Yeah, this is a tough question um, because largely it would kind of depend on the on the community, but if we're talking the whole world and, and, you know, I'm always wearing that hat of, um, the guy who's, who's always wanting to talk about Leroy and talk about his legacy. So in, in that capacity, um, as, as, as the authority on his life and works academically, I would have to say the studio version of proudest monkey because it is genius. It's a work of genius. It, it's, it's the track that I always show people, to describe why Leroy is a genius um, and and to, to dive a little bit deeper into that um, and, and I'm talk, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because we all know that track but at the apex of that solo when Carter's really going crazy the instinct of every saxophonist on earth would be to go crazy with him that's what we're passed down through the jazz tradition that we that we react to what's going on around us um, and Carter and Leroy are both jazz musicians um, we, we learn, we, we get this from the John Coltrane Quartet, right? This high energy, just energy, build, 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 build. Leroy doesn't do that. Here's Carter Beaufort going insane on a drum set that is probably as big as my living room. And then Leroy just play these, plays these beautiful round notes. It's, it's like a paper airplane over a, a tornado. It's, it's the most beautiful thing. Um, it's, it's, goes against the instinct of probably every other saxophonist on earth, but he knew what was right. He knew that was the right choice. And so in, in my capacity as, as the Leroy guy, that's the one I would play. Okay. So the next question is a new one. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to phrase this right, or if it's going to be a regular question in the lineup from now on. So we're going to give it a spin. If you had to pick three song titles and assume that people know the message behind the songs, assume that they know the lyrics and, and what the song is saying. If you had to pick three song titles that best told your life story, what three song titles would you use? Ooh, that's a good one. And so we're, we're going with just titles, not the actual song content. Correct. Just titles. And like, you don't have to, like, it doesn't have to be literal. It can be the message behind the song Proudest Monkey or um, the the chorus to Dancing Nancy's. Just 
kind of picking out three titles where those songs are the songs that best represent your story. Uh, in that case, I'd have to start with Halloween um, because that's that's um, it, the idea of, of some sort of affection that's been perverted. Um, the second I would have to choose is Crush. Um, very soon after I left my house, um, I, I met my wife, and that was another huge turning point in healing. In, in, um, so the idea that um, you can be saved by love. So crush would be the one. And I think, you know, this might be a little bit of a, an odd choice. Um, but I think I would probably go now with samurai cop because I'm a dad now. Um, and you know, we can debate the merits of old DMB versus new DMB, but at every point in my life, there's been a song, both lyrically, musically, thematically that has matched what I've gone through at the time. And I think samurai cop, perfectly encapsulates what it's like to have a child, to have a son. I have three sons. So um, if I had to narrow it down to those three, I would choose those three. Very interesting. Uh, I think I'll keep that question on the list for future guests. I might uh, rephrase it a little bit so it comes across a little more clear, but uh, I I think I'm going to keep it. So, um, before we round out the, the rest of the interview, as we ramp it up, we kind of dig a little bit deeper into your life story, and we cover both sides of the spectrum, the best point in your life and one of the worst points in your life and how the music is impacted. So we're going to do um, – we're going to do the – I don't know how to phrase it. Maybe not the worst moment, but a low moment in your life. Uh, tell us what that moment was and – more importantly, tell us what DMB song impacted that moment, or maybe there wasn't at the time, but now when you look back, there's a song that gives that particular time context. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, aside from the obvious ones, I, I think I would say the song that really pulled me up out of the funk I was in right before I left home was JTR from the Lily White Sessions. Um, because it was such a dichotomy between how um, how how strained and, and tired his voice sounds on that recording versus the fact that the song is just a killer and, and so, like, just jams. And so that's how I felt at that time, that I had so much go- ahead of me if I could just get this monkey off my back, if I could just get away. And I remember very specifically being at RFK in 2000, and it was just pouring rain um, and, and just awful. And they opened with JTR, and that was the first time I heard it live. I'd, I'd heard, the, I think at that point, the Lily White Session. No, they were not out. That was 2001. Um, but, you know, back in the day, you had to download from tapers. It could take you four hours to download one song. You're listening to it on WinRAR. You know, this is old school stuff. So, and it's all tinny. But here I was hearing JTR full bore right in my face in the middle of a downpour. And I remember thinking, uh, first I remember thinking my naivete, how, how a song could be both happy and sad at the same time. And then thinking that's exactly how I feel right now. And then when the Lily White sessions did finally leak, that even further solidified, you know, even these guys deal with stuff sometimes, even these guys have problems. And, and, the way they dealt with it was they wrote songs about it. They they dove into the music. And so it, it was just another affirmation of this is what you need to be doing with your life. I'm curious about something with your story, what you shared so far. I know a lot of the trauma came from your mother, but uh, sometimes songs aren't literal and we can apply them to our lives. Do you have any sort of affinity for the song Raven and and – you know, this boy growing up and just walked away after he was fed up with so much chaos and death and realizing that his parents were molding his world and he had to escape that somehow. It seems to me that you might have an affinity for uh, Raven because of the, the content of the song. That's very interesting because I, I do have an affinity for Raven, uh, but solely because of uh, Leroy's work on it. Um I what you're suggesting though I have that that relationship with Gray Street um, 
the the idea of being abandoned and and um, you know the line the man she calls her father and and all that stuff. And and I believe the reason for that is is because I mean I I was raised by women my mother obviously but then my grandmother was a huge positive influence in my life and and I owe a ton to her so I was always around these strong women and so I wonder if I didn't more identify with the girl in that story that was the song that really encapsulated my my feelings of grief and 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 depression and and things like that um, so it's it's. Interesting because yeah, you would assume that Raven would be the the one, but but I love Raven because the Roy always just plays incredible stuff in it. Gray Street was the one lyrically that 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 I always identified with as as being um, similar to what I was going through. Yeah, I have a a similar kind of view on um, the song "Deed Is Done." It's not. I can't take every line, lyric for lyric, and apply it to my life. But but overall, even though the song is about a girl and a baby, um, the the context in that song, what the girl is going through, how she views God during this moment, um, is is very much a song just like you in Gray Street, where if you were to sit down and read it, you wouldn't be able to pull out the context or the commonality but if i told you my story and then you sat down and listened to it you oh, okay that makes sense so i, I absolutely right. understand you know what you're saying there um all right let's go to the other end of the spectrum then uh, i want you to pick a keynote moment in your life one of those days that are just stands out among the rest and tell us if there was a dmb song that impacted that good moment or gives context to it when you're looking back yeah, there's there, there's a little bit of a build up here in that um, my my wife and I were friends before we were ever a couple, and um, we we were a couple um, before we could tell people we were a couple without getting getting too involved, and so one of the things um, that we one of the things that happens when you fall in love is all of a sudden those songs on the radio make sense to you, right? All of a sudden those things that you thought were cheesy and that makes no yep. sense. You go, oh, now I yep. get it. Absolutely. And, and it was like that for me with Crush. Um, I loved Crush, obviously. It's a killer song. Um, and, and also with Crash Into Me, Crash Into Me was so oversaturated in the 90s. It was There were prom themes based around that song. And so it had lost a little bit of its willpower and and so, uh, and songs like "Say Goodbye" um, and and recently, and and I didn't understand it. And then when I when I met my wife and 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 I ju and just completely fell head over heels with her. And all of those songs made more sense um, because they weren't these Shakespearean odes. They were they talked about the the gritty side of it, the 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 lust side of it, the the anger side of it, the you know the is the is what we're doing right side of it. You know, and so for me, Crush is really the one that that I can very clearly pinpoint because I I remember I gave so we we weren't exactly out as a couple to people, and I remember she and a friend had stopped by my house, and I had given her before these crowded streets, and I said, hey, that uh, track eight is the one. I hope it's track eight, or I, my credibility's out the window, but <laughs> track eight is the one that uh I, that song I was telling you about, and it was Crush, and she messaged me later and said. I don't know what to, that's, it's beautiful. I don't know what to say to that. It's amazing. And so then I, like that song suddenly had a lot more clout, you know, it had a lot more meaning and, and it was nice because I felt like I understood the music a little more too. You know, it, it was, I could, I could really get what he was talking about. All right. So one of the uh, final questions we have and <clears throat> sorry. And, one of the most difficult ones, at least from my perspective, if I were in your seat, is, is the most difficult question to be able to elaborate properly and really get the message across. But let's say you met somebody who didn't know a damn thing about DMB and you had to relay the overall story of their message behind the music. How would you break that down for somebody so that they can understand what the music is all about? 
Yeah, this is an, an interesting question, too, because I've I've actually had to do this um, in an academic sense, because when you write a dissertation, you have to write a proposal and then your committee has to approve it. Um, so having to justify to these academics um, that writing about the saxophonist of a popular 90s band was academically viable, I, I had to justify. So what I would say is that in a musical sense, the band is a, a perfect melting pot of American musics. Um, jazz, funk, R&B, bluegrass, country, folk, Americana, rock and roll, all of these, um, they're, they're derivatives of, of blues and, and jazz that comes from the turn of the last century. And so Dave Matthews Band is, is, a, is a perfect example of, of how those muses could interact, that, that even musically we're more similar than we are different. You know, I say to people sometimes the difference between bluegrass and bebop is the spelling. And, and that's that's true. It sounds flippant, but there's so much that that is similar in those things, and they just perfectly kind of melded it together. And so there's something in there for everyone. And if there's something that's in there that's not for you, if you're not a fan of bluegrass or jazz or something like that, I don't think that it would dissuade you from listening to them because it's presented in a way um, that is that I think is palatable to everyone's musical tastes. Um, the essence of the band is America. It's American. It's multicultural. It's multiracial. Um, the world music influence from, from Africa and all of those things. I, I mean, I mean, jazz and blues is derived from Caribbean and African music. You can't, you can draw the line from Dave Matthews all the way back to, to African music and, and not just because of Dave's African connection. Um, but that included. So, Dave Matthews Band is American music. It's the most American music I think you can get because it's almost all American music. And while it might sound like a casserole with a bunch of ingredients that don't go together, it works. They, they made it work. And without restriction, without restricting one another. And on top of that, the, the message that they're sending, you know, the, the seize the day, to live in the moment, to live your life, to love one another, to, to, uh, to, to do good for the world, to leave things better than you found them. Um, there's a lot of bands that have that message. There's a lot of bands that combine a lot of music. But there's not a band that's been able to do all of that as well, both musically, lyrically, professionally, as Dave Matthews Band has. I think that was really well said. That would be a great way to, to explain the band um, and their overall message. Um, Bob, I want to thank you for, for coming on for the first interview. Um, we had a discussion before the interview started that uh, we would keep the stories mostly based around uh, not just Bob's experience, but how those experiences impacted him and that we would come back later for a second interview um, that dives a little bit deeper into Leroy and Jeff and, and Bob's life's work, where it's more about the experiences he's had we can discuss rather than the impact those experiences had on him. Um, I can tell you right now that this is going to be the first episode of season two. Um, the amount that you were able to articulate and share is impressive and I enjoyed every moment of it and I can't wait to have you back on for the second time but before we close out one thing we, we do is we give the platform over to our guest and let them just speak as long as they want about whatever they want to speak about and then if you want to give any shout outs sometimes people are shouting out people on Twitter or social media or charities or foundations whatever it is that you want to promote uh, this will be your chance and then listeners if there's something that bob shares uh, you can go to our episode page at dmbondemand.com slash podcast and you'll see a description of the podcast and that will include links uh, to anything that bob may share um, you'll find those notes anywhere if you're on apple Podcasts or google Podcasts, but you can always find them on dmbondemand.com so with that being said, um, Bob, the floor is yours. Take your time. Let us know if there's 
anything else you wanted to share and then any shout outs that you have. Well, first, I, I want to say thank you for having me on. You, you've been incredibly kind and, and I, I very much appreciate it. Um, I'm spreading the word about Leroy and his contributions to American music has been has been my life's work. Um, and so uh, the, the opportunity to do that, um, I, I'm so appreciative and I, I can't wait to come back and, and talk about um, the work that I've done. Um, for those of you interested, um, um, and I don't know if we ever explicitly said it, but I, I wrote a doctoral dissertation on, on Leroy's life and works um, as, as part of my, my terminal degree. Um, it's available to read for free at my website. It's www.bobfusen.com. And you'll see right on the side, there's a big section that says Leroy Moore, a biography. Um, I also have a, a blog, which I haven't updated in a while. Um, I had to take a little bit of a break after writing and, and grad school is very demanding and and I, I, I needed a little bit of because it was an emotional journey as well to step back. So the blog's a little bit outdated, but I'm hoping to update it soon. And, and that's at Roy Lives, R-O-I-L-I-V-E-S dot Tumblr dot com. Um, and if you want to watch the lecture recital that I did on Leroy, um, if you go to YouTube and just search uh, Leroy Moore and then Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, Korff, K-O-R-F-F. That's the name of the, the music school in Nebraska where I was at. There's a ton of information on there um, about Leroy and, and his life and works and why I consider him an unknown titan of American music. Um, in terms of other shout outs, I, I have to say that I'm extremely grateful for, first of all, uh, um, Chester Copperpot, um, Jason, who, who does incredible work for this community and I relied so much on his videos when I was writing um, because part of it was cataloging the equipment that Leroy uses and being able to see that and oh, it was it was such a help such a help um, that was that was huge DMB Almanac is another one that that could really use your support um, Dreaming Tree um, any of these DMB organizations that that need your help to keep those servers running please help them out it 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 was an invaluable thing for a researcher like myself. And my hope is that in years to come, there will be others who follow behind me and, and continue this work uh, uh, with Leroy. Um, in terms of charities, um, I would ask, please donate as much as you can to any organizations that are helping ensure that we keep our voting rights, um, any organizations that are helping people with cash bail, um, any protesters funds that are, uh, that, that need money that are coming out of the things happening in Minneapolis and now Phoenix today that I see anything that can help keep us a democracy. Um, please, please, please give generously. Well said. And like I said, folks, there's going to be links on the episode notes where you'll be able to click to everything that Bob uh, just mentioned. So, Thanks again, Bob, for coming on. Um, you've been open and and uh, shared an amazing, an amazing story. And there, there's more to it, I know. And I'm excited to to go ahead and schedule you and get you back on here. This is going to be that first episode of season two, so we're going to be starting off on the right foot here in a couple of weeks. But uh, thanks for coming on and taking some time to share your story. And we'll talk to you soon. Hosting this segment titled The Way I Heard It After Each Interview. I will pick a handful of co contributors each week to call in and break down what a song means to them and how they apply the song's message in their own life. This will be a great way to compare and contrast how the music has shaped our lives both individually and collectively. So let's jump right in. This week, the friends joining us are Bob. Bridget and Jesse, and the song we'll be exploring is number 41.
Number 41 is incredibly important to me. Four years ago, I went through my first breakup, right out of high school in my first year of college. It was around that time that I rediscovered DMB, 12 years after dementia destroyed my father's mind and stole his ability to play their music for me. In the first few months after the breakup, I was completely destroyed. I could barely get out of bed, I'd lost 10 pounds, which is incredibly dangerous considering my metabolism, and all I felt like doing was sleeping. During that time, rediscovering DMB was one of the only things that made me feel anything other than pain, and it was number 41 that taught me how to get back on my feet. The lyrics instantly resonated with me. To me, the song is about the incredibly complicated process of grieving. You suffer through it, hearing over and over again in your mind things like, I wanted to stay, I wanted to play, I wanted to love you. Then, when you finally gain a little bit of feeling back, you start thinking, my play on time is one. You think you're out of the woods, but the difficulty is coming. And just like that, you're back in bed, unable to move, until a few more months have passed and you're able to go an entire day without thinking of them. You still have to admit, I'm only this far, and only tomorrow leads the way. But when your heart finally heals, and you're able to stand strong on your own two feet again, you realize that you were given a gift all along. You were given the opportunity to be reborn, to pull yourself out of bed, tame your mind, and discover new things you would have missed if you hadn't been grieving. New friendships, new paths, and eventually, a new relationship. I saw DMB live in concert for the first time in 2019 at the Hartford Xfinity Theater, and right from the moment they started playing number 41 as the opener, it felt so right. That moment, for me, was true healing. There I was, standing next to the person I was truly meant to be with, feeling the music rush through my heart. In that moment, I knew that my grief was over. My play on time was won. The rest of the concert was amazing, but I'll never forget standing there hearing those opening chords and just having this rush of adrenaline and pure joy as I realized they'd picked the opener I was hoping for. Number 41 taught me that there will always be an end to grief. No matter how deeply you've sunk, you will find your way out when you are ready and strong enough. Knowing that, I can take on anything that stands in my way and come out of it a better human being. I love this song, and it will forever be a part of my journey. And that is something really special. Hey friends, my name is Bridget, and the song I'm discussing today is number 41, and what it means to me. What a beautiful song. Um, it picks me up and hugs me tight every time I hear it. For me, it's a song about love and never losing hope, uh, never forgetting to see the good in everyone. It's about keeping perspective that the glass is half full and not half empty, regardless of what everyone else is doing. It's important to go your own path and find your own way out. The important life lessons are listed in the song, bringing water for all, to keep playing and praying and loving and dancing, and I look forward to embracing tomorrow. And even still, when things do get bad, because they can and will, to soak in those moments of pain, to remember not to let time pass you by, and to remember to run into the rain, and to play, to allow those tears to splash all over you, because there's beauty in everything, even the pain. 41 has taught me to keep the joyous wonder, to keep on playing and praying and dancing, and to remind others to do the same. My mom always said, if you don't bring enough to share, don't bring any at all. And with that, I say always give and share and bring water for all, because you'll find that that's what keeps your glass half full. Peace and love, friends. Black Lives Matter. I love you all. Number 41 is one of those songs that really showcases the, the flexibility and the genius of Leroy Moore. The fact that he moves seamlessly back and forth between flute and saxophone is really indicative of his abilities on both instruments. Leroy's a really underrated flute player. His sound is so warm and lush, uh, and I just have always loved hearing him play on this version. It's 
It's a, a very unusual arranging technique to have someone take a solo on one instrument, then have a brief instrumental uh, uh, segue into that same person soloing on another instrument. Um, it's quite unusual in, in popular music. Um, and of course, his playing on it is always just uh, just sublime. The, the song means uh, a lot to me because it really was an opportunity for Leroy to stretch out and show his gifts, which were playing the exact right thing for the moment and building a, a story. You know, when we solo in the, the, the jazz and popular idioms, we often liken it to, to a narrative, to, to building a certain narrative tension uh, that we eventually build up to a release. And that's very, very difficult to do. And Leroy was masterful at it. So hearing him build those themes, uh, build a solo just from small building blocks until it becomes something altogether uh, uh, whole. You know, you see the entire canvas for what it is. The other thing that is very interesting to me about number 41 is that it's a, a, uh, a practical application or a popular application of a of an idea that we we get from jazz, which is the interaction of jazz musicians in the moment. And that's not to say that it doesn't happen in other forms of music, but jazz musicians really have it down to a science. It's it's really one of the things that they do very well, um, going all the way back to the early days of jazz. And so this idea of building up the energy and listening to one another, you know, even though one person might be soloing, that soloist is interacting with the rhythm section, with the drummer, with the bass player, and there are little variations, and everyone's building together and 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 raising the tension. You know, that's a that's a real life example that you can point to of the jazz influence on Dave Matthews band. Um, it, it's it's just brilliant how they build that tension together so well. The other thing about number 41 that to me is uh, important in my life is number 41 is how I was introduced to Jeff Coffin. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I would visit these forums and, and everyone would talk about what the best DMB shows were and uh, many of the shows of the Flectones were brought up in those conversations. I had just discovered Leroy and DMB and I was a, a very young saxophonist trying to kind of find my way in the world. And uh, so I started looking up these shows with, with Jeff Coffin playing, hearing him play on number 41 and all of his talents and abilities and gifts on the saxophone which are numerous numerous uh it was just an amazing thing and so from that moment on uh Leroy Moore and Jeff Coffin were my primary influences uh on the saxophone they were the two guys that I listened to the most they were my favorites um two sides of the same coin the the way I I like to describe it is you know Jeff and his playing is like Shakespeare and Leroy and his playing is like listening to your granddad tell a story on the front porch. Both equally moving, both equally important, both um, important for the development of you as a person, but vastly different. Two sides of the, the same coin, uh, so to speak. So that was my first introduction to Jeff Coffin, was hearing him just absolutely destroy number 41. And the, the really brilliant thing about the genius of these two guys is I never walked away from those recordings thinking, wow, Leroy really got his butt handed to him. You know, Leroy's thing was always so intense and so deep and full of storytelling. And then Jeff's thing was so full of fire and the, these pyrotechnics and, and they just complemented each other so well. So it, it, it was great to hear the two of them to, together on those recordings uh, because it was just so amazing to hear these different voices uh, and and have these different uh, these different styles kind of kind of uh, mesh together in this this brilliant song. So number forty one's meant a lot to me because it's been such a vehicle for for some of my favorite saxophonists of all time. What's interesting enough is that uh, after Leroy passed. During my, my research and, and hearing some things, and this has been since confirmed, I think, on, on Twitter by Stefan, is uh, Leroy didn't care much for number 41. And for a long time, I thought it was because, you know, maybe he didn't like the song. 
And uh, come to find out, he was just really reticent to take that much solo space. Leroy was humble to a fault. And after years of playing that song and it being primarily a, a vehicle for him to, to showcase his talents and abilities, um, he wanted to step out of the, the limelight of it for a little bit. Uh, he felt that he had said all that he needed to say. So it wasn't so much that he disliked the song. He just was apprehensive of the spotlight as he was his entire career. Uh, you know, there were times early in his career where he would literally tell the, the venues, uh, ask them if they could shut the lights off on his side of the stage because he wanted to play in darkness. And, you know, so I can understand having this really big solo moment that every fan knows uh, that would be daunting for someone with his particular personality. And, of course, we all know that the listener-supported version, which is, frankly, a, a masterpiece, uh, again, in, in contemporary improvisation. I, I say that about Leroy a lot, but it really is just masterful, uh, the building of themes. The way he introduces some themes and some things in the flute solo that he then revisits later in the tenor sax solo, it, it's, it's just just really beautiful the way it's constructed. It's storytelling. It's almost vocalese. It's almost word-like. And, of course, his interactions with Carter and, and the rest of the band is just uh, unmatched. I mean, it's it, it's watching a, a, a masterful piece of fusion and jazz and improvisation happen in real time, but in front of tens of thousands of people, uh, which usually only happens at big jazz festivals. So that's another testament to the genius of Leroy. I mean, not only was he this incredible musician who was steeped in the tradition and the jazz language and had all the credentials that, that you would expect from a master of that, that form. Uh, but he was so successful at it and, and so so popular doing it. Uh, it. It's just amazing to me that tens of thousands, and in some cases hundreds of thousands of people, would sit enthusiastically to hear uh, uh, an improvised saxophone solo like that. It's it's truly remarkable given uh, the, the way that this country kind of treats jazz and, and the arts in general. Well, that does it for this week's episode. Thank you for tuning in and supporting our goals with the podcast, the online shop, and Twitter campaigns. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, or want to be one of our co-contributors for the Way I Heard It segment, then DM me at DM Beyond Demand on Twitter, or email me at dmbeyonddemand at me.com. Always love.